All right. Now, if anyone fucking clips this, let niggas know. This is a Mr. Fusion video. Goku tracks bad guys. Uh, I was paid $200 to react to it. I like this nigga's videos, so I'm expecting quality. The other two videos I've watched, or I watched, were a complete quality from this guy. Um, He mentioned, he says the Japanese names of the characters and moves and whatnot, so if he sounds weird to you, that's it. Obviously, you should subscribe to him. I really... I really like it. I really like his channel. And yep, that's it. So let me throw down 1.25. I wonder why Mr. Fusion. I noticed this about his videos. He uploads in. 720p. I wonder why. Blew himself up. Come back to Dragon. All right. Welcome back to Dragon Ball Dissection and back to the Cell arc. When last we left, Cell blew himself up. So, hmm, I guess we're done here. This is gonna be a short episode. Oh wait, <laughs> I got a hole in my trunks. Jumping back a smidge, we see Goku, Kaio, and Bubbles floating next to the Serpentine Road, all with halos. Huh. I didn't know Kaio could fly. But, you know, he's a martial arts master, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. But Bubbles? Really? Bubbles? The monkey? There is no way he knows how to fly. And, and don't tell me this is some kind of power granted to the dead. If that was the case, Goku's flight wouldn't have been limited by his current skill the last time he was here, and he wouldn't have had to give up and start running. Goku brings up a good point. What happens to you when you die, but you're already in the afterlife? Apparently for these three, not much. I guess that makes some sense. Goku has already been judged once, so maybe he doesn't have to go through the process again. Kaio is an upper god, and might I add, he refers to himself here as the most important person in the universe. Damn. So perhaps he doesn't get judged at all. As for Bubbles, he's a flying monkey. You don't pass judgment on a flying monkey. But Cell, he doesn't <laughs> appear to be anywhere. That's because he's back on Earth, killing trunks. When Cell emerges from the dust cloud, he spins a yarn so implausible it makes the Flintstones look like a documentary. Cell's self-destruct is poorly named because it destroyed everything but himself. He possesses a never-before-mentioned clump of cells in his head that serves as a core of sorts, and as long as that is intact, he can fully regenerate just from that tiny bit. Ahem. <clears throat> that is not like Piccolo at all! But, you know, fair enough. Even he says he was surprised by it. Not only that, but he can regenerate into his perfect form even without number So, eight. one thing I want to mention, right? Um, I don't like the ending of the cell arc. I found this out like um, upon my reread with Mir. I don't really like this ending. I don't really like Cell coming back and then Gohan finishing the job after that. I really don't like it. I think Dragon Ball Super Superhero, like I know this, that shit was not planned when this came out. I think Dragon Ball Super Superhero would be better if Cell didn't come back already. If this shit right here did not happen, Dragon Ball Super Superhero would be better. Like Gohan going beast and actually getting the job done would be so much more satisfying if he didn't already get that shot at redemption. 18. Well, isn't that convenient? Not only that, but he's even stronger than he had been before because he benefited from the Saiyan near-death power-up. And as if all of that wasn't... Okay, that part is stupid too because Cell has already regenerated before and not got stronger. Like when Goku blew his top off with the, um... With the Kamehameha, the Instant Transmission Kamehameha. He blew his shit away and when Cell got up, Goku and him both note that they both dropped in energy from that happening. So Cell returning, let alone gaining his perfect form... It was, it's really just mid, bruh. Enough. He came back to Earth because he teleported. It's just a skill he picked up. 
You know, they say that writers should never force an audience to accept. Oh, yeah, and this too. Cell learning the move from Goku using it with him? Like, what? I mean, I guess it speaks somewhat to Cell's uh, adaptability because Vegeta had to train a lot for this, and so did Goku. Goku supposedly spent 180 days meditating to, like, get his spirit intact or whatever. But, yeah, I don't know. Except Just more than weird. one impossible thing at a time. So you really have to admire Toriyama's guts to shovel this much manure and just start flinging it in every direction. We all know the reason it's here. If a wimpy cell came back, what kind of final confrontation would that produce? Heaven forbid we get the same kind of broken down, struggling to stand up kind of fight we had in the Saiyan arc. Everything's gotta get bigger. So throw out a long list of really implausible stuff in order to once more make Cell a credible threat. Now, a lot of people raise issue with Cell's nucleus, and rightly so. He claims it's a clump of cells in his head. However, we've seen Cell lose the entire top half of his body, and he was fine. To be honest though, that never bothered me too much. It's probably something Toriyama did indeed forget about. However, to me, it seems easy to rationalize that that proviso only applies if Cell is truly in danger. If all else fails and everything else is gone, this one clump can do a full reboot. In less dire situations, he wouldn't need it. He never says it's the one and only thing in his body that allows him to regenerate in general. Compared to the rest, it's the least implausible. Seeing Trunks shot through the chest, Vegeta loses it and goes after Cell, only for Gohan to injure himself trying to save Vegeta. I swear it seems like Kurdidin is angrier at Vegeta- This is also stupid. Um, so Gohan, when he gets up, he's like, well, I didn't think Cell was that strong. But he can sense Ki. And when the Z fighters sense Ki, it's against their will. Like, it's something they just have on all the time. Like, when somebody powers up, it, they sense it, right? Why did Gohan rush in to protect Vegeta at less key? Like, Cell disabled his arm with that one key blast. Why did Gohan rush in at Vegeta with such little key that Cell could one shot one of his limbs? I don't know, it's just dumb. Vegeta for this, then he wasn't Vegeta letting Cell become complete. But I don't even put them in the same league. I can forgive irrational stupidity much more easily if it's done for humanitarian reasons. Isn't that right, Kurdidin? While there really hasn't been much interaction between Vegeta and Trunks that might lead you to believe he'd react this way, it is a much more satisfying turn for Vegeta than the whiny baby he's been up until now. Character growth aside, in the here and now, Cell is stronger than he ever was, and Gohan only has one arm. So despite being so reared up a minute ago to avenge his father, now Gohan is just going to stand there and let Cell blow him up along with the world. Hmm. Maybe that's where Trunks learned it from. Thankfully, Goku gives him advice from the afterlife. You idiot! I had to sacrifice my life because you were screwing up so badly. Now you're going to waste that by screwing up in the exact opposite direction? What is wrong with you? Well, you know, it was something like that. I might have taken a few liberties in the translation. <laughs> so with his father backing him up, Gohan engages Cell in the ultimate beam struggle. I suppose it's left up to personal interpretation whether or not Goku is actually, somehow, contributing his power, or if it's symbolic of Gohan having his father's support and inheriting Goku's never-give-up attitude. And this is one of those things I much prefer being left ambiguous. At the very least, Goku's guidance can help push Gohan to victory, even though he's losing. I agree with that. I like the fact that that's left ambiguous. To me, it sort of implies Goku's not actually helping him. Because, you know, if, if I think if Goku was actually helping Gohan, he would probably be in Super Saiyan to give him, like, his max support. His base Goku's not doing shit for this Kamehameha, let's just be real. Goku accuses Gohan of holding back in order to keep from destroying the planet, which he says can be fixed with the Dragon Balls. Well, if Gohan does go so hard as to actually destroy the planet, whether or not there are any Dragon Balls is going to be a moot point, so I think it's a good thing that Gohan is sparing a little bit of thought for that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Vegeta attacks Cell from behind, and that distraction is enough for Gohan to completely and utterly destroy him. When I talked about regenerating villains before, one of my complaints about the concept was that there is no tangible progression that leads to defeat. The villain can regenerate from anything, until the moment the writer decides it's over, and then suddenly he can't regenerate anymore. It's especially glaring given that Toriyama had just given Cell the ability to regenerate from next to nothing, which was caused by an explosion inside of his own body, but this happens to leave nothing. I'm not saying it's implausible or wrong or unsatisfying, I'm just saying that logistically it leaves you wanting. However, narratively, this moment ties everything together nicely. Gohan, pushed to the brink, gets the boost he needs to save the day. 
Unlike Cell's regeneration, Gohan's wounded arm is a tangible liability. Forced to perform a one-handed Kamehameha, Gohan mirrors his father, who long ago saved the world while suffering a similar handicap. And Vegeta once again pivots from being a liability to an asset. How come- what the fuck? How come I never made this parallel before? How come I never got this shit before? What the hell? They both saved the world with one arm. That's kind of cold, bro. And, and, and he's supposed to like be becoming the savior and Goku's not there anymore. That's, that's kind of cold. How the fuck have I never seen this shit before? That's so insane. That is, that's hard as fuck, bro. And Vegeta once again pivots from being a liability to an asset, apologizing to Gohan, assisting him in the kill, and admitting that both father and son had outdone him before vowing he'll never fight again. Yeah, I'm sure that'll stick. <laughs> Earlier, there were just enough Senzu to heal exactly every person from the Cell Juniors, but not a single one left to fix Gohan's arm. Convenient. <laughs> so as the group, sans Vegeta, fly back to the temple to get sweet, sweet Dende healing, Toriyama appears to suddenly remember that Yamcha exists. After spending the majority of the arc standing around in the background, Goku Ina only got injured protecting Tien, like Gohan protecting Vegeta. Yeah, I guess. That's, that's kind of cool, too. Now falls back into his classic Fred from Scooby-Doo role, transporting Gohan, making the wishes, giving romantic advice. He jokes about using the second wish to get a necklace for his girlfriend, who is totally real and everything, but you just never met her because she lives in Canada. He even delivers the <laughs> Your Daddy Really Loves You exposition to Trunks once Trunks comes back to life. You know, the fact that Yamcha gets that moment with Trunks rather warms my heart. After all, he doesn't trust Trunks at first, and after learning who Trunks is, the fact that he possesses no bitterness says a lot. You know, it's not my favorite use of the character, but it's an improvement. I just find it funny how sudden and concentrated it all is. Somehow, Mr. Satan is the only member of his trio who managed to see enough of the conclusion to understand it. So when the announcer asks what happened to Cell, Mr. Satan claims he stepped in and finished the job. Everyone else left after thanking him. But this is such a, this is such a funny moment, bro. Like, cause, you know, it's so funny, cause... Bro, I would do the same thing. What? <laughs> These niggas saved the world and left? I'm definitely taking responsibility for that. Like, <laughs> easy. Mr. Satan's lies, but you'd be wrong. Amid the Dragon Ball wishing, we get the continuation of the Kuririn in number 18 subplot. While she is surprised to find herself with the good guys, she doesn't behave violently. However, when Gohan announces to the world that Kuririn must be in love with her, she acts like an embarrassed middle schooler, insists she's not into him, and flies away. She does, in fact, stick around when she notices Shenlong being summoned, and while she ultimately continues the adolescent route, she does appear impressed with Kuririn when he attempts to use the second wish to turn number 17 and number 18 human, but instead settles for removing their bombs when that wish can't be wished for. Perhaps she's just annoyed that Kuririn didn't pick up on the obvious resemblance that indicates number 17 and number 18 are twins, not lovers. Now I arrive at the main event something I've been looking forward to talking about for a long time. With the first wish, the characters bring back to life everyone killed by Cell. So, you know, Trunks is dead for a whole three chapters. <laughs> that plot point does wonders for Vegeta, but not a lot for Trunks. Hard to miss you when you barely leave. And I'm not even going to get into my musings on what happens to a time traveler's soul if he dies in another timeline. But Goku does not come back to life, as he has already died once before. The characters argue that he should come back on the grounds of, Please? Pretty, pretty, please? But before they get very far, Goku cuts in to tell them not to. It's not all bad. Since he gets to keep his body, he can train with all the dead masters of the past. Makes sense. Kaio could have come back to life too, but he chose not to so he could keep Goku company. Why? First off, how does that work? Like with Goku refusing to be brought back to Earth last arc, what does that even entail? Does Shenlong ask him? Does he feel a pull away from the light? But even ignoring that, what difference does it make? Kaio already exists in the afterlife. His being dead makes no difference besides having a halo and apparently a flying monkey. That's just the weirdest thing to even mention. Now, all of what Goku says is simply a plot-mandated excuse to put Gohan into the protagonist role. I mean, that, 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 it is pretty weird. <laughs> like, being real, bro. It's pretty weird that King Kai wouldn't come back to life, and it's pretty fucking weird that, uh, that Goku... Oh, he hasn't mentioned that yet. The, let's just say this title, bro. I haven't seen the video, but this title, the question mark, I've always wondered what the fuck Goku was talking about, too. 
Just like the beginning of the arc, the author insists on moving the plot in a certain direction, and some explanations must be given to justify why the characters don't just go to Namek or something. The allure of training is one reason, and it's understandable enough. But what he opens with is a real doozy. Bluma once told me that I attract bad guys. The Earth will be safer if I'm not around. Okay, first off, Bluma never says that. Kaio says something similar when Goku is looking for new Namek. Well, that's not a big deal, you say. It's a tiny mistake, and you can easily assume Bluma also tells him that at some point we don't see. Normally, I'd be inclined to agree. But this is being used as the opening premise for Goku refusing to come back to life. And that premise isn't even true. Let's look back through Dragon Ball here. Does Pilaf try to take over the world or do bad things because of Goku? No. Does the Red Ribbon Army? Also no. Does Piccolo? No. Do Oolong, Yamcha, Pu'ar, Ten Shinhan, or Chaozu? No! All of those threats operate completely independently of Goku, who typically wanders into their plots when they're not inadvertently attracting him. Even this arc, which technically is set into motion because of Goku, is revenge because Goku stopped the Red Ribbon Army from their global conquest. I find it very difficult to argue that Goku attracts bad guys because he once stopped them from doing the bad things they were doing without him. The Saiyans do initially come to Earth because of Goku, so there is some credibility there, but they're also the ones who send him there in the first place. And Vegeta and Nappa come to Earth because Piccolo opens his big mouth. The only time I can truly agree that Goku attracts a villain to Earth is with Frieza. It's already ridiculous on its face, but that makes his second assertion even more difficult to swallow. Has it been proven that the Earth is better off without Goku? Quite the contrary. It just goes to show how incredibly screwed the world would have been without him. That's not even <laughs> remotely debatable. Just because during the course of saving the world, he creates enemies out of people who already want to conquer and or destroy the world, absolutely cannot invalidate how much more the good outweighs the bad. And at this point, almost all of his loose ends are tied up anyway. Piccolo is on his side, Vegeta nominally is, the Red Ribbon Army has been taken care of twice, remnants of Frieza's army are pretty much all that's left. I mean, who else would you expect to come after Goku who would actually present a threat to any of the characters? Sudu Senin? Pilaf? The family of Bear with a sword? I think we'll be okay. In fact, as this very arc goes out of its way to point out, Goku's influence often causes people who would otherwise continue on a destructive path to rethink their lives and do good. So while it could technically be argued he has attracted all these people he now calls allies and friends, he has transformed them in the process, which is a good thing. All of that- This nigga's cooking, by the way. Like, what, what the fuck is this nigga talking about? Like, what, 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 was, what was Goku talking about when he said that shit, bro? Like, oh, maybe, maybe because Goku was on Earth, all those evil people were there. Like, maybe it was just Goku's existence. And I guess Toriyama does keep it consistent, right? Because when Goku comes back for the one day, you know, his, his uh, Bobbity comes back and whatnot. But, I don't know, it's just so weird and never implied. That would be bad enough as a justification to jettison the main character, but consider this. If Toriyama really needed an actual failing of Goku that would serve as a compelling reason for him to choose to stay dead, a point that exists in this arc, a point delivered specifically by Bluma, it really shouldn't have been that difficult to find one. I've been talking about it on this channel for over a year, bringing it up every time a situation gets worse, and every time the characters seem to forget they put it into motion. That's right. While everyone can share in the blame, Goku's actions, or rather his inactions, are largely responsible for all that transpires in this story. And now, at the end, this moment practically gift-wrapped itself for Toriyama. This one moment could have taken what I consider to be the arc's biggest flaw and turned it into its greatest strength. It would have been so incredibly easy, and it would have so tightly locked the concept of Goku's greatest failure into the texture of this story. Even if Toriyama hadn't had it in mind when the story began and was just using it as an excuse to move the plot along, it still would have retroactively transformed the opening into brilliance. Why does Goku think the world would be better off without him? This right here. He let his thirst for battle get the better of him, and inadvertently inverting the same great influence that had caused this ragtag group of former villains to mend their ways, momentarily caused his friends to either act the same way or become complicit in it. Now, the Cell Arc Part 3 has become one of my most talked about videos in this series, which I can only say is a good thing. 
Whether or not you agree with all or any of my points, I feel honored that I generated debate on this topic. There are certainly a smattering of people who have raised a well-thought-out counter-argument. To briefly summarize, Goku's increasingly reckless behavior is a consistent direction of Goku's character development, and it exists by design. Without appropriate challenge, he has become bored, leading to this arc, wherein his irrational decisions finally culminate in his own death. He has paid for his failure, but that, of course, finally provides him with more mountains to climb. Trust me, I would love to believe that. But I just can't. I'm not saying that a theme necessarily has to be overtly intended by the author to be a valid interpretation, but I also feel, if that is the case, that such a theme must be able to stand up to scrutiny, and I don't think it does. Even if it were to explain Goku, for example, it doesn't explain nearly all the other characters flip-flopping on practicality as the plot demands, but I certainly don't think such an interpretation was anything Toriyama had in mind, because when the moment to pay it off arrived, it was the furthest thing from Toriyama's mind. Consider Goku's mistakes regarding how he misreads Gohan. That situation is clearly set up, the circumstances play out, the characters confront Goku over it, and Goku acknowledges that he made a mistake. This is never referenced again. It's never paid off. That's because it exists for one purpose and one purpose only, to provide an excuse to keep the plot going. Having served that purpose, it completely exits Toriyama's mind, forcing him to create a completely out-of-left-field non-explanation instead. That's why I can't give any of this the benefit of the doubt. Okay, that's quite enough ranting. Wait, then Ten Shinhan says he's leaving and will probably never see any of them again. You know, at least Vegeta's declaration had some ties to his character development. This is just completely random. Why? <laughs> Why are you never going to see them again? Because he reached an arbitrary ending? Wait, wait, I said no more ranting. So Piccolo says he's going to live at the palace for anyone who honestly still thinks that he is, in fact, Piccolo, as opposed to God wearing a Piccolo suit. Because he's totally now God wearing a Piccolo suit. Everyone might say God is useless, but he managed to completely bend Piccolo to his will, and therefore take the ultimate revenge. I'm just saying. Gohan creating Yamcha and Trunks leave, and the next day the four of them meet back at Capsule Corporation to wish Trunks off. And even Vegeta shows, in his own emotionally stunted way, that, well, you did good, kid. Daddy's proud of you. And hopefully he won't beat you anymore. The present is saved, and Yamcha, Kuririn, and especially Gohan can now enjoy the peace they've worked so hard to ensure. At least for quite a while. And it is a satisfying ending. But it's not the ending. Next time, while the present is saved, what about the future? We'll find out, and then we'll look back at the arc as a whole, as we finally conclude our analysis of the Cell arc. See you next time! But before you go, I have a special announcement. I have finally launched a Patreon page, as many of you have suggested. There are several tiers filled with goodies. I mean, bro. Like I expected, bro. Good video. That's really all you can say after finishing a Mr. Fusion video, bro. Good video. That's it.